Uh, I'm Aron Aji. I'm the vice president of the organization. I'm in charge of vice. Um, <laughs> this is an incredible event. It's a little bit like Thanksgivings in our family as our family grows and we borrow chairs from neighbors. We eat less turkey, but we each eat a little bit of it. But I hope you also see how crowded we have become as a group. This year, I think we have broken another record. It's, uh, I think we will have over 350 participants. I invited all my cousins, no. <laughs> <coughs> there isn't a lot of entertainment in Turkey lately, as you know, we have an election coming Monday, Sunday. So tonight uh, we celebrate uh, sort of the, the best expressions of our art together. And uh, we began that already with the incredible Travel Fellows reading. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm going to yank it like Canaan, but I'm not. <laughs> um, just, just think about it. 140 people submitted literary translations for the Travel Fellows. Just ask yourself, where are they translating? Where are these people sitting and translating? And look at also us. This is really an incredible moment in the evolution of our art. This is an incredible window of opportunity for us where really translation matters. We always knew it, but a lot more of us are now becoming aware. And really, um, we need to let everyone know and, and, and encourage everyone to become learned, sensitive readers of international writing. That's also our job. And we celebrate tonight, in fact, some of the best expressions of, 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 of our art as uh, they have been uh, nominated and selected by an infinite number of juries. Um, and um, we will be celebrating winners in four different um, translation awards. And um, this is already a very large number. As you know, we began this year um, awarding an NTA for poetry and an NTA for prose. But we also have, of course, our Lucian Strike Award. And then we have a new translation award that um, I will let Russell talk about to you. So we decided to split things so that Russell is not the only one who is constantly asking you to help us. <laughs> So, and I will do that later, but we'll first enjoy ourselves. So first, I will ask Russell to come and, uh, and please uh, introduce the, um, the, the shortlist for the um, two awards, Ital the Italian uh, Literature tra Literary Translation Award and the Lucian Strike, and then we will continue with the NTAs. Russell? Hi, just lost my glasses. Okay, yes, uh, Riches. We have four awards this year, um, which is very impressive. Um, and uh, just recently, I think it was yesterday, today, uh, we got the shortlist and winner from the selection committee for the new Italian Prose Translation Award, which is, uh, was inaugurated this year. Um, we scrambled a little bit to put everything in place and the selection committee worked really hard very quickly um, and um, it's a five thousand dollar award it's going to be awarded annually from now on uh, the donor the the donor is anonymous and prefers to remain an, uh, anonymous and um, uh, we are this year we it was um, because this was the first year we decided to make it a multi-year award catching three years worth of um, published Italian fiction and, and creative nonfiction in the last few years. 
Um, next year, uh, when we do this in a slightly more timely fashion and give ourselves a little more time to breathe, uh, it will be just for the previous year's published works. But this year it covered um, several. And the shortlist, they're not in the program, because I said we printed the program, and these just came in yesterday from the selection committee. So let me read you the names of the five shortlisted titles for the inaugural year of the Italian Prose Translation Award. They are The Day Before Happiness by Erri De Luca, translated by Michael Moore, My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante, translated by Anne Goldstein, Blindly by Claudio Magris, translated by a Anne Milano Appel, Wallachek's Dream by Giovanni Orelli, translated by Jamie Richards, and A Pimp's Notes by Giorgio Faletti, translated by Anthony Sugar. And um, what we're going to do is, I think we're going to follow the same format for all four awards. So we're going to tell you what the shortlist is, then we're going to tell you what the winner, who the winner is, um, you can applaud. Uh, then we will read a little bit about what the judges had to say, where we have those comments from the judges. We will read a little bit about what the judges had to say about that particular work, and then we'll invite that person to come up and read a little bit, okay? And luckily, I believe we have three out of four people here, and the fourth has a designee, okay? So, here we go. Um, the winner of the inaugural um, Italian Prose Translation Award is Blindly by Claudio Magris, translated by Anne Min Min Milano Appel. Come on up. And since... Come on up, yes. And since um, the, the committee, as I said, was working so quickly, they, were man they managed to get us the names, but not a, a nice description of what they thought the about the book. So I'm gonna ask Anne to tell you a little bit about the book in this case, um, and then read a little bit of her translation. The publisher is, is Yale University Press. Yeah. You can say that, please, Anne. Before I say, I was going to say that first it was Penguin Canada and then it was Yale University Press. Um, but before I say a little bit about the book and just read something very briefly, I wanted to tell you how interesting this is uh, to me because this was, um, when, well, when I got the, the email yesterday morning, I was about to leave for the airport and the guy was from the airport transport was just about ready to knock on my door. I was shutting my computer down. And that's when I got the email, and I thought, well, where am I going to find something to read if I have to read? And so I scurried around, and the only one that I could find was this, uh, it's not even from the published book, it's a, a reading that I did here in Alta in 2007, which is, uh, it was one of the bilingual readings, and it was before we even had a publisher for the book, and after that it got published by Penguin Canada, and then it was picked up by Yale University Press. So to me, it's sort of like uh, coming full circle, you know, with, with this particular title. So anyway, the book itself, it, it is a novel, and it's been described as a, um, let me put my glasses on if I'm going to read this, um, as a shifting choral monologue, and uh, that's how critics have described it. And one critic, um, I mean, I'm talking about the Italian critics, described it as a um, pazzo lucido, um, a, a lucid madman, because it's a, uh, the voice sounds like it's, um, you know, frenetic. It's it's kind of almost like um, ranting. It's 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 it goes on and on, and it goes through time and space, and it's it's difficult to follow until you get the rhythm of it. And it's a choral narration because it deals with different characters in different points in time, but they're all kind of like every man, and that's the idea of it. And um, on the face of it, Tor Torre, the protagonist, is a patient in a mental health institution. Uh, so you never really know, is he, is he crazy, is he sane, or who is he, and who, who is the narrator of this book? And it goes on, on like that. So the um, part that I'm going to read to you, I, I'm not going to read the whole part 
that I read in 2007 because that was uh, like a 15 minute reading. But I'll just read um, a, one part from chapter, a, a la later chapter. And it has to do with um, a figurehead. Uh, there's a, uh, the figurehead becomes almost like a light motif. It's repeated a lot throughout this. As those of you who know Magdis's work know that the, the sea is very important. It's a, it's a huge symbol in his work. And in this particular work, the, the, the figurehead of a ship becomes a, a symbolic. It's both um, a saving figure, it's the, it's the guiding figure that guides the ship, it's a saving figure that um, a drowning sailor can hang on to if the, the ship is shipwrecked. And on the other hand, it's almost like an indifferent figure, a god figure, because it has this look that's always looking somewhere and you don't know where, and it's, uh, indifferent to the uh, trials and tribulations of those on the ship. So it's looking ahead blindly, if you will. So this is about the fig a figurehead, and he says, this is the lucid madman talking. He says, this is Galatea. She was found on an African beach following a shipwreck, and she was worshiped like a goddess by the, sh by the Aborigines. Other figures ended up adorning inns and taverns, so that the sailors might feel a little more at home even when they were on land. You see, figureheads were evicted from the sea, and so they manage as best they can. I've discovered more than one of them displaying a coiffure in a beauty shop, beauty salon window, or modeling a dress in an apparel store, well disguised, of course, a proper mannequin, but they didn't fool me. Still, I pretended not to notice. Everyone gets by as best as they can. We buried one of them. Read what it says here, the one from the Rebecca, a whaling ship from New Bedford, among the rocks by the sea. Under the bones of the waves, as they say in Iceland, we drank beer in her honor, her funeral beer. Women should have one too, funerals. It's only fair, we got drunk and sang the office for the dead on her grave of sand and stones. Lewdness too, as was fitting. Death is lewd, sorrow is lewd. I'd like to piss on my grave. The flowers on a grave have to be watered, don't they? I even do it when nobody can see me there in St. David's Park. On the figurehead from the Rebecca, all we did was pour some beer. But we didn't do it on purpose. It's just that we were a little drunk. Besides, the waves quickly washed it away. That rank odor vanished in the salt sea air. And now there's not a trace, not even the grave. The tide scraped and sucked it away. Maybe now she rises and falls on the open sea, corroded by the water, wood that is no longer distinguishable from any other re remains of the shipwreck. Even a face composed of flesh soon deteriorates. The fish devour it, and it quickly becomes unre unrecognizable, an unrecognizable piece of flotsam from the sea. It was I who pushed Maria on the open sea and under the sea. I threw her to the sharks as food, and so I was spared by them. Savage teeth tore her from my arms. No, it was I who let her go, who shoved her into those jaws, all the more voracious because her heart was bleeding and the brutes get even more excited at the taste of blood. The slave drivers lash out more enthusiastically when they see red trickling down their captives' back, backs. And so she disappeared in that shadowy sea, in that darkness. But I read that sometimes shipwrecked figureheads return. Maria disappeared on the open sea. The ship vanished over the horizon. And when I heard that it was returning to port, I also heard that it was returning without her. She was no longer there. They must have treacherously thrown her overboard. Of course, how could I think that one small push? I read in the catalog about a sculptor who chose his beautiful girlfriend to be the model for the figurehead of a ship on which she was about to leave on a long voyage. For her, soon afterwards, the longest voyage of all, she died. Every day he watched the sea disconsolately. He couldn't believe she was dead, and when the ship re-entered the port and he saw the figurehead standing upright on the prow, identical to her, he leapt into the water to go to her, longing to embrace her, but he went under. Waterlogged and dazed, water in his nose and his mouth and his ears, it was impossible to see the ship as it passed by, to see whether she was there or not. She wasn't there. Eurydice vanishes. Look how beautiful she is, this Eurydice, Eurydice wiping her tears with the edge of the mantle that envelops her. 
She too is in La Spezia, the captain says. We'll see if I'm able to successfully recreate her, that mantle in the dark water, the night, the bottom of the sea. I'll pull it over my head and we'll stay under there, close together, clinging to one another. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Anne, um, and congratulations. So um, I'm also gonna uh, um, announce the winners, the winner, the, the shortlist and the winner of the Lucian Strike Asian Translation Prize. The, the shortlist is, uh, for this award, is in fact in the program, but I'm gonna let you know the titles just to remind you. Uh, Kalidasa for the 21st Century, translated from the Sanskrit by Mani Rao, published by Aleph Book Company. Um, Cat. Town by Sakutaro Hagiwa, uh, Hagiwara, translated from the Japanese by Hiraoki Sato. It's a New York Review of Books book. Salsa by Hia Yu, uh, translated from the Chinese by Steve Bradbury. It's a Zephyr Press book. And um, Something Crosses My Mind by Wang Xiaoni, uh, translated from the Chinese by Eleanor Goodman. is a Zephyr Press book also. And Sorrow Tooth Paste. Mirror Cream by Kim Hyo Son, translated from the Korean by Don Mi Choi, is an action books book. And the winner of the 2015 Lucian Strike Asian Translation Prize is Something Crosses My Mind by Wang Xiaoni, translated from the Chinese by Eleanor Goodman. And I'll read. And I will, I will read just a little bit the, the blurb that the, the judges asked us to put in the program. This is a quote. I rush down the stairs, pull open the door, dash about in the spring sunlight, end quote. So begins the exquisite collection of translations by Eleanor Goodman of poems composed over the past several decades by Wang Xiaoni. In what follows, we are taken out into the streets and on cross-country cross trains into villages, cities and markets. We peep out through the windows of the poet's home and sense the nostalgia invoked by a simple potato. Here is a poetry of the everyday writers in delicate yet deceptively simple language, written, sorry, written in delicate yet deceptively simple language and translated beautifully into its like in this first collection of Wang's work to appear in English. Something Crosses My Mind offers up the fresh, refreshing voice of a poet forging her own path, neither shunning the political nor dwelling in the lyrical, but gently and resolutely exploring her world in her writing. Please welcome uh, Eleanor Goodman, sorry. There is really nothing more wonderful and um, more unnerving than receiving the acknowledgement and um, encouragement from one's peers and colleagues and role models. So I'm very much overwhelmed uh, to be in here, um, especially given the incredible field this year, um, including another fantastic translation from Chinese, um, Steve Bradbury's Xiaoyu, uh, his salsa, which is a gorgeous translation. I hope everyone in this room buys all of the books on the list. <clears throat> uh, it is also very humbling to join um, the ranks of the people who have already received this prize, including um, Lucas Klein, who's here, who's absolutely magisterial. Xichuan's um, uh, Notes from the Mosquito, I also highly recommend to everyone. Um, I want to thank Alta uh, and Erica Mena in particular for putting this together and for providing an incredible community for all of us. Um, translation is a really lonely business. Uh, you spend most of your time in front of your computer. So <laughs> thank you so much for um, not just this incredible conference, but also um, for this um, community of wonderful, wonderful individuals. Um, I also want to thank Jim Cates um, and Zephyr Press for making a really 
physically beautiful book. Um, it's beautifully printed, it's beautifully edited, it's wonderfully put together. Um, and I feel incredibly lucky to have somehow um, stumbled into this wonderful, supportive um, press. I also want to thank um, the guy who did all that Chinese singing earlier today. <laughs> Um, he was Kanan Morris. He was one of my earliest um, serious Chinese editors um, and taught me a lot. I also want to thank someone who is not here today, and that is Wan Xiaoni. Um, she took a chance on a young, at that time, pretty inexperienced translator and agreed to let me translate her work. Um, and it has been quite a journey. <clears throat> I'll just read a few poems to give you a taste of her work. Thoughts upon crossing Yunnan, Guo Yunnanji. The tigers retreat, the hawks retreat too, the killers and the killed flee to other provinces. The sky clears its lower left corner. Below, Yunnan covers its head to sleep. This red lord of the manor sleeps comfortably. From the side, the curves are suddenly high and round. A red body shows beneath the green robe, deeper than red, deeper than cliffs, deeper than the demands of seeds. There is only red, not fire. There is only a body, not a lord. The grass climbs up to the top of its head and shakes with fear. The canyon's teeth sparkle with lazy light. The soil grows fat with clusters of corn. Red Yunnan doesn't work and doesn't get flustered. Now empty mountain echoes run everywhere. I hold tight to my heart and pass through the red lead tongue. Um, Wan Xiaoni does write a lot of travel poems. She writes a lot of poems from trains, and part of that comes from the fact that she was born um, in 1955 in Jilin, which is in the very northern part of China, and in the 1980s moved to Shenzhen, which is right across from Hong Kong, so pretty much it's like going from Maine to, say, Arizona. Um, a very disorienting kind of um, transition, and she writes a lot about what you see from train windows in part because she spent a lot of time on trains, cross-country trains. <clears throat> Plowman, Geng Tian de Ren. He is turning over the whole mountaintop with a plow. He follows behind an ox, and the two reveal the earth's forehead by force. A dark red wound appears, the red seen after a fever passes, the red that comes after punishment, the red that comes after pain has been quietly survived. Suddenly, the small plowman disappears. The just turned red mud has buried him in the mountainside. His partner raises his enormous head like he's another plowman wearing an ox mask like the pair at the front and back of the plow are brothers. The tobacco seeds are still in the burlap sack. The work has just begun. They stop, one coughing high, the other low. Then dust covers their faces, and everything is quiet again. Um, if you know anything about China or the history of China, you know that red is a very loaded uh, concept, term, uh, it has a lot of historical meaning. And Wan Xiaoni is a highly political poet, but um, she is very subtle in the way she expresses her politics, as anyone living and writing in China needs to be. Um, that poem is very political, as is this one. Love, Ai Qing. Ah, that cold autumn. Your hands couldn't soak in cold water. Your jacket had to be ironed night after night. And that thick white sweater I knitted and knitted in vain was finished like a miracle into a time when you'd wear nothing else. Ah, that cold autumn, you wanted to dress like a gentleman. 
Talking and laughing, we passed the days. Laughing and talking, we mystified people, both friendly and mean. In front of those eyes, I held your hand and thrust myself into every crevice with a conscience. I should have been born a giant bird, but now I must draw in my wings and become a nest. Let all those unready to lift their heads see me. Let them see the heaviness of the sky. Let them undergo a withering of the soul. Ah, that autumn, so cold it was poignant, that unyielding and bitter love we had. Moonlight is very white. Late at night, the moon exposes every bone. I breathe in a pale breath. The world's irritations become falling fireflies. The city is a lifeless skeleton. No life can match this pure night light. Open the curtains, and before my eyes, the universe mixes with silver. The moonlight helps me forget I'm alone. Life's last act is silently rehearsed on a swath of white. Moonlight arrives on the floorboards. My two feet are already pale. Um, since this is a short poem, I'd like to just read the Chinese so you get a sense of the musicality in the original language and also of uh, the incredibly rich materials that I had the pleasure and the honor of working with. Yeguangbaidhu 打开窗帘Um, tonight, partly for my own pleasure, I chose poems that um, I don't usually read in, when I give readings from this book, uh, sort of to rediscover all the incredible stuff that's, that Wang Xiaoni has to offer. Um, but this poem I always read, and I like to finish with it, um, because I think it really describes what all of us as translators and writers and poets are trying to do. Um, and it's also a kind of expression of her own um, personal poetic ethos. It's also one of her most famous poems. Starting anew as a poet, 重新做一个诗人. At the shortest end of the century, the earth bounces. Humans busy themselves like monkeys between trees. But my two hands lie idle in China's air. The tabletop and the wind are both pure white paper. I let my significance happen only at home. Rinsing white rice, the rice starch drips like milk onto my page. To be reborn, the gourds extend their fingers and cry out in fear. Outside, the sunlight cuts with a knife heaven's cold, heavy snow. Each day, from morning to night, the door is shut tight. I hang the sun at the angle I need it. Some people say, in this town lives a person who doesn't work. Fastened to the walls, between two small pieces of glass, the world self-combusts. The taciturn butterflies flutter everywhere. The universe unknowingly leaks its secrets. I foretell the tiniest signs of trouble without eyes without hands, without ears. Each day, I write only a few words, 
like a knife cutting into the gush of a tangerine's finely woven juice. Let layer upon layer of blue light enter into a world that has never been described. No one sees my light finely woven strand by strand like silk. In this city, I silently serve as a poet. Thank you. I mean, honestly, what beside this would you rather be doing? <laughs> Wasn't that incredible? The National Transition Award is um, a tradition at Alta, and um, this is, as I mentioned before, the first year that we decided uh, to start awarding two separate uh, awards, making two separate awards. <coughs> so I will start with the short list um, for the NTA in poetry, and then we will move to the um, short list and the readings, obviously, and the reading for the prose. By the way, um, most of these titles are available at the bookstore, and uh, please uh, do consider uh, getting your own copies. Um, okay. Um, so for the NTA awards, we received uh, 120 uh, titles this year. Uh, a formidable number, because uh, this is a, a, a quite a um, scrutinizing um, competition. We, as you know, we evaluate texts both in terms of their uh, consummate quality in the uh, translation, but also um, for their uh, relationship to the original. So it's a, a rigorous process, and uh, we congratulate everyone who um, were even nominated, and definitely, of course, those who have made it to the shortlist and then the, the winner. So this year for poetry, <coughs> we have Breath Turn into Timestead by Paul Celan, Romania, translated from the German by Pierre Joris. Guarding the Air, selected poems of Gunnar Harding by Gunnar Harding, Sweden, translated from the Swedish by Roger Greenwald. Black Widow Press, I'm sorry, uh, the uh, Brethren into Timestead was uh, published by Farage Traz and Giraud. Um, Wallace Space by Ernst Meister, Germany, translated from the German by Graham Faust and Samuel Frederick from Wave Books. In the Illuminated Dark by Tuvia Rubner, translated from the Hebrew by Rachel Zvia Back, University of Pittsburgh Press. And Sheds by Jose Flore Tapi, translated from the French by John Taylor, the Bitter Oleander Press. And this year's award, the inaugural Poetry NTA Award uh, goes to Brethren into Timestead by Paul Celan, translated uh, from the German by Pierre Joris, who could not be with us. So, um, Jerome Rottenberg will uh, read for him. What, what a great pleasure and what an honor to be here uh, for Pierre, uh, who asked me, first of all, to thank all those responsible for thinking of him and Paul Salon uh, and the award. Uh, a project that for uh, Pierre Joris has gone on, I think, for something like a, a, a half 
century or you know, approaching the, the, the better side of 40 years, 40 years to 50. Uh, so a, a, a lifetime uh, project. Uh, I first met Pierre Joris when uh, uh, he was uh, just graduating from Bard College uh, and uh, friendship grew over the years and then uh, uh, many collaborations with him on, uh, on translation, on assembling uh, anthology-like uh, books. Uh, uh, so th th there's, a, there's a closeness there, but I've also watched over the years as uh, uh, he's grown as uh, a, a poet and a thinker about poetry, a thinker about translation, uh, a concept of what he calls nomadic po poetics, uh, but also a view of poetry reaching out across uh, continents and, uh, and worlds. Uh, he is from Luxembourg. Uh, but his chosen language for writing is, uh, uh, is English, uh, you know, uh, American English that has been uh, welcoming uh, to other poets who have come from uh, other places, from other languages, uh, 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 entering into our own. Uh, so Pierre is a writer of English, uh, you know, but he's also uh, being Luxembourgish, uh, uh, with English, a master of four languages, uh, Luxembourgish as the, uh, uh, the mother tongue, uh, uh, German as the first school language, French as the second school language, uh, you know, and English, but particularly American English, uh, you know, by his own will and selection uh, at about the time, uh, a few years before, you know, I first got uh, to know him. Uh, I had uh, m myself done the first published translations of uh, Paul Celan uh, in, uh, uh, in English uh, in a little book from uh, City Lights Books, The Heart of the Beat Generation, uh, called New Young German Poets. Uh, early poems of Celan, including the famous Death Fugue. Uh, but then I began to face the later poetry uh, that was starting to emerge at that time. You know, I met Ceylon, we spoke about further translation, but I, you know, Ceylon is so intensely you know, and strangely a poet of that language, uh, you know, from a country that destroyed his family. Uh, but you all know the, the Ceylon story, uh, you know, and uh, uh, it really needed, um, there, there have been many translators of Ceylon, uh, you know, but. Pierre comes at it uh, with an almost native ear for the, the German uh, and uh, a poet's ability uh, to uh, create a version of it in another language. Uh, so I uh, think it's uh, uh, a, a tremendous achievement and uh, uh, I feel honored to be able to honor him and to do the best that I can uh, in, in reading his, uh, his translations uh, from the section called Lichtzwang, or Light Duress, and uh, he suggested I read the opening poem of this selection uh, in German and then in English, and for the rest I will just read uh, in English. Forgive my German. Hör Reste, seh Reste, im Schlafsaal 1001. Tag nächtlich, die Bärenpolka, sie schulen dich um, du wirst wieder er. Sound scraps, vision scraps, in word 1001, day nightly, the bear polka, they retrain you, you again become he. Night rode him, he had come to the orphan's fro frock as flag. No more false runs, it rode him straight. It is, it is, as though the oranges stood in the privet, as though the thus ridden wore nothing but his first birthmark secret speckled skin.
muscle heap with the scree mace I drove in between, following the rivers to the melting ice homeland toward it, the firestone to be incised according to whose sign in the dwarf birch bomb. Lemmings borrowed, no later, no bowl urn, no pierced necklace, no star foot fibula, unappeased, unconnected, artless, the all transforming, slowly scraping, climbed after me. Scooped with the ash ladle from the being trough, soapy at the second try toward each other, incomprehensibly fed now, far outside our and already wherefore, heaved asunder then at the third try, blown behind the horn before the standing tear conveyor, once, twice, thrice, from unpaired budding cleft, flaggy lung. Larded with microlith, giving given away hands, the conversation spinning itself from tip to tip, singed by spraying blaze air, a sign combs it together as answer for a brooding rock art. And then three poems from uh, the section called Eingedunkelt, uh, which he translates as Tenebrid. Unscrupulously against the obfuscations, the hanging candlestick glows itself downward towards us, many-armed torch now searches for its iron, hears where from, from human skin closeness, a hissing finds, loses, harsh it reads, minutes long, the heavy, shimmering behest. After the light waver, the day bright resounding from the errand, the flowersome message, shriller and shriller, finds to the bleeding ear. Explicit, wide, the open parenthesis hug, release the lovers also from elm root confinement, black tongue ripe at agony becomes loud again, the glossied draws closer. Thank you and honor to my dear friend Pierre Joris. So for the um, short list for the National Translation Award in prose, uh, the titles, they are actually fascinating. Uh, I, I, in fact, thought that maybe beginning next year we should have some kind of a poetry project that you come up with a poem by visiting the book exhibit. Because uh, we're really getting very, very good at these titles, you know. Uh, the unbearable lightness of being would be jealous, I think. <laughs> so here are the shortlist uh, finalists for the um, NTA in prose. New Wow Saharan Oasis by Ibrahim Al-Khoni, translated from the Arabic by uh, William Hutchins. Center for the Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. End of Days by Jenny Eppenbach, 
translated from the German by Susan Bernofsky, New Directions Publishing. The Woman Who Borrowed Memories, Selected Stories by Tove Jansson, translated from the Swedish by Thomas Thiel, New York Review of Books. The, the next two titles actually talk to each other very nicely. Why I Killed My Best Friend by Amanda Michaela Poulou, translated from the Greek by Karen Emerick. Open Letter Books, Anna Karenina. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. By Tolstoy. <laughs> it's, it's a little embarrassing, isn't it? By Leo Tolstoy. Leo. Translated from the Russian by Marian Schwartz, Yale University Press. And Running Through Beijing by Zhu Zishan, translated from the Chinese by Eric Abramson. I really. I did, didn't I? No, two lines press. I'm very, very sorry. But see, <laughs> this is what Erica is. Thank you so much, Erica. Indispensably. All right. Uh, and the. Winner for this year is New Wow, Sahara and Oasis by Ibrahim Alconi, translated from the Arabic by Bill Hutchins. Bill? Congratulations. Um, I thank the judges, uh, this microphone and I may or may not get along too great, so tell me if that's all right. Um, I thank Ibrahim Alkuni. Uh, he was a finalist for the Man Booker International Prize earlier this year. He's a uh, Tuareg, a nomadic Berber, who was educated in Moscow and is a citizen of Switzerland and lives in Spain, of course. Um, my translation was edited by Wendy Moore and Christy Shuey. Christy Shuey also did the book design, and I thank them, and I thank the judges. Um, I'm going to read from the opening of the book. This is called The Winged People, and it starts with an epigraph from Pascal. What? Didn't you say the sky and the birds prove God's existence? <laughs> for as long as he could remember, he had listened for counterpoint in the bird's song. In fact, after many seasons had elapsed and the gullies had experienced numerous floods, he felt certain now that this hidden bird's polyphonic skill was the secret reason he had been fascinated with it over the years. The bird's soft, gentle call, which reminded him of wind whistling through reeds, could not be transcribed in any script, nor could the tongue mimic it. It began as a faint murmur, and then a mournful cooing immediately came in and rose to a robust melody that sounded like the vibrations of the imzad's lone, mournful string, harmonizing with the second lower string. These two then blended together to create sadly, mournfully, and lyrically, an epic that told the entire desert story. The secretive call created an equally secret message, the song which could not be recorded by an alphabet or even pictographs, and which thwarted any attempt by a tongue to imitate it, began with a soft, mild, mysterious, nebulous murmur that stirred longing and that, as it grew ever louder, breathed life into concealed embers, into sparks, that have always been the wayfarer's law and that have always served as the religion of the wasteland's inhabitants, who since their birth have never stopped searching for what the wasteland has hidden. The bird's call suddenly became polyphonic as another concealed bird joined in, and then this new voice keened a different ballad. The two melodies created a counterpoint and harmonized to become a single tune, a new carol. Then the song changed course and soared into another realm 
transforming the bare land and extending its expanse. The wasteland's temptation grew ever more intense, and the desert promised a new reunion, an everlasting one, that was born the same day the wayfarer was, and that burst into existence the same day he did, even though the wayfarer would depart and wander off while the promise remained. The eternal temptation endured as a hint of an impossible reunion and functioned as a huge snare to lure wayfarers to the desert and to life by flaunting a promise of an oasis and a reunion that would never be fulfilled. In the newly expanded distance, delight triumphed and the heart overflowed with ecstasy. The body quivered with a dance-like tremor because a glow had appeared on the horizon, because a torch had cleft the dark recesses of the pale eternal horizon, appearing for a brief glimpse as a flash of lightning. And this was the sign the wayfarer had craved for a long time and had struggled endlessly to observe. Then the stern, hostile, eternal emptiness supplied a signal like sparks of revelation, and he saw what he had never seen in that expanse and discovered what he had never been able to find. In fact, he discovered what he had not wanted to find. So how could his frail body keep from trembling ecstatically? How could a tear of longing not spill from his eye? The desert welcomes birds twice a year. In the spring, flocks arrive from the south, spend a few days in the nomadic encampments, and then call to each other to resume their voyage to the countries of the north. In the fall, they come from the north, spend some days in the camps again, and then call to each other to travel to the lands of the south. People say that in the past, the flocks preferred oases as migratory way stations, but that these dense throngs of birds alarmed the oasis dwellers who thought the onslaught threatened their crops. So they fought off the birds, set traps for them, shot arrows at them, and beat drums to frighten them away. Then the birds abandoned the oases, and migrating flocks avoided cultivated fields, eventually choosing the desert's nomadic camps for their stopovers. The desert people consider their arrival a very good omen, and their sages reckon the bird's landing a heavenly sign. So diviners travel for quite long distances to meet the birds when the flocks arrive, and follow them for even greater distances when they depart. It is said that the diviners pursue the flocks of birds to discover the enigmatic insights that the spirit world has encoded in their behavior, songs, and flight. The diviners are not the only ones delighted by the bird's arrival. All the desert people go out to the open country when the first flock appears on the horizon. The sages hurry out before anyone else to greet the migrating community. They head to the wasteland in scattered groups, striding with noble arrogance, preceded by the leader who walks alone, decked out in his ceremonial regalia. Trailing the nobles are the warriors, also grouped in units. Behind the men come clusters of women who drag their children after them, wave their babes in the air, and chant cheerful ballads, trilling an epic into their children's ears. Here are the birds that gave you to me last year. They've come again. Here's the obilbil, the egret, which brought you to me, returning to see you. The birds are your mother. The birds are your father. The birds are your brothers. The birds are your family. The birds have come to visit their child, who a whom they entrusted to me, the birds have come to reclaim their trust. When will you be old enough to accompany the birds? When will you sprout wings so the flock will accept you into the tribe and you can migrate with the birds to the land of the birds? Tears of longing stream from their eyes. These are the tears of desert mothers who know with a mother's intuition that when an infant is born in a homeland called the desert, no mother will enjoy motherhood long because the infant whom a bird brings into the desert will inevitably imitate the avian community and leave the nest sooner rather than later. Once he departs, his troubles will never end. The mother knows that the desert's legal system is what the law has established and that it treats the babe in her arms as a bird. Once he ventures off alone, she will never be able to reclaim him. From that moment on, the desert will hold him and the poor fellow won't return. He will never look back at the tent, at the nest, and his mother will have lost him for good. That's why the mother holds her nursing infant high and throws him into the air the day the birds land. She weeps and croons heart-rending songs in honor of this maze because she knows with the mother's intuition that once a son 
heads off into the desert. He's not leading, he's not heading off to life, as all mothers hope, but to a maze, he's heading into a labyrinth, one from which he will never return. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all the winners and all the finalists and all the nominees uh, for all these awards. Uh, you have certainly uh, enriched our lives this year and will continue to in years to come. You know, we may be just three and a half percent, but we're a very, very, very good three and a half percent. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this particular event, um, the Poetry Center at the University of Arizona, Phony Media. What? The Poetry Center is there over there. There they are. Thank you very much. You, you, you've been a very wonderful host. Thank you very much. And Fino, uh, Phony Media. Here. <clears throat> And I can show you Amazon Crossing. No. <laughs> thank you. Uh, where are they? There they are. There. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, all of you have a hand in the advancement of translation, and we really thank you for all the, um, all the support. Um, this has been a long Thursday, but we still have things to come in Declamation. Not for the faint-hearted, <laughs> but uh, please stay around. But again, thank you very much. Thank you.